Hey everyone, this is Mike from the Comic Book Trove, here today with another Omnibus review. And today I'm going to be taking a look at the X-Men by Chris Claremont and Jim Lee, Omnibus, Volume 1. Now this book was one that was uh, highly sought after and very hard to find for many years, for myself and for everybody in general, because it had been out of print for, I think, close to 10 years when this finally got reprinted, which I think now was the end, just either right at the end of last year or the beginning of this year. A little while ago now anyway. But uh, it's a book that even when I see it now, I've had it you know, since the reprint came out, so around a year at this point, it's still one I'm very excited and happy to see in my collection every time I see it on the shelf. Um, and I'm sure others feel the same way, and maybe others are not quite uh, sure about what's in this book. And so I thought today it was about time I get around to cover it, covering it on the channel and just dive into it a little bit, because I think this does throw a few people off. I mean, for example, straight away, I'll just say that having it referred to as the X-Men by Chris Claremont and Jim Lee as a title is already quite misleading because as I'll get into the book and show there really isn't a whole lot of Jim Lee artwork in this particular volume most of that is in the second volume of this two volume set which in and of itself is part of Claremont's whole larger run so it's a bit of an odd way to name this omnibus in the second volume and you could say the same for other omnibus collecting Claremont's X-Men really because it can get a little bit confusing to know exactly what book fits in where. I don't think the titles really do Marvel any favours in making it easy for collectors, in particular new collectors, to understand that stuff. So I'll try and give an overview of some of that as we go through here. But firstly, I'll just show this dust jacket off. This was the direct market variant. Now, I know that some people don't really like the style of this direct market cover in particular and, and the very similar one used for volume two because of this uh, horizontal image, which obviously leaves a lot of kind of empty space. I get that you might not like that kind of cover for, you know, a book like this. Um, I always thought it was really nice though. I don't know why. It just looks quite, I don't know, quite sort of neat. Um, and it, I think it matches really well when you have the same direct market cover style for the second volume. Obviously that's personal preference. Some people much prefer the other covers at the end of the day. It is just a cover though. It doesn't matter too much. But, you know, let me know what your thoughts are on the covers anyway, which one you went for or prefer generally. Uh, the spine on this one, uh, this particular direct market cover, you get that image of Wolverine, that uh, Jim Lee Wolverine down there. I think on the standard variant, it was a, an image of Dazzler, which is a little bit random. <laughs> I know I prefer having Wolverine on the, uh, the spine myself. But anyway, um, and then on the back, you get your cover gallery, you know, standard affair for a Marvel omnibus. Typically get to one of these. And then you've got the cover, uh, not the cover, sorry, the content at the bottom down there. Um, now, so it starts off with issue 244, runs up to 269. So in terms of where it fits into the overall Chris Claremont run, because this is sort of the back end of Claremont's run, really, um, or at least getting towards the end, this takes place immediately after the Inferno event. So the Inferno event, which in itself had been the culmination of quite a lot of long ongoing story threads by that point. And I'll just give a spoiler alert now. I'll quickly summarize Inferno and obviously talk about stuff that's going on in this book. So be wary of that if you don't want to hear any plot points about Claremont's X-Men run. I'll probably mention a few things as I go through here. So the Inferno event being the culmination of Madeline Pryor's story arc, where she had turned out to be a clone of Jean Grey, created by Mr. Sinister. She'd kind of turned evil and become the Goblin Queen. New York had become all demonic. Um, Ileana Rasputin, who was with the New Mutants as magic, she had been reverted to a child at the end of Inferno. It was a really kind of big event, the first massive event of its scale, really, in the X-Men, even though you'd had four of the mutants and mutant massacre before it, I'd say Inferno was a bigger scale event than both of those. And the first real kind of true crossover event as well that actually did cross over between X-Men, X-Factor and New Mutants. So this is taking place immediately after that. Obviously it's uh, dealing with the fallout of that really as a result. You've got the X-Men uh, during this whole time as well, they're based in uh, Australia, in the Australian Outback, and this era is generally referred to as the Outback era. And it is an odd era of, of X-Men for that reason. So, you know, they're not in the X-Mansion. Um, during this time, it's not some of the kind of key team members you perhaps most strongly associate with the X-Men, like 
uh, Cyclops, you know, Scott Summers, Jean Grey, um, they are not part of the team. Um, Kitty Pride's not in the team at this point. Nightcrawler's not in the team. Uh, the main team lineup in here, it's, uh, and it changes even during this book. This is a period of change for the X-Men, really. It's uh, an interesting time, to be sure. Um, but what you've seen as well, mostly in this book, I touched on the fact that it's, you know, it's called the Claremont and Lee omnibus, but really Jim Lee, I think he only draws six issues in this entire omnibus. He was really not the regular artist during this time. Um, there's a couple of issues that start this off though, issues 244, 245, like a couple of fun issues really, I assume to kind of be a little bit more upbeat and fun following on from Inferno, which had been really quite a downbeat and sad event overall, quite tragic. Um, so the first one in here, 244, is like a girls' night out with a female member of the team go for a go for a kind of night out together, and then this one's the uh, the boys' night out, and this issue is actually guest penciled by Rob Liefeld. Um, don't worry if you're not a Liefeld fan, this is the only issue he does in here, but uh, yeah, worth pointing out. Certainly an interesting issue. But most of the artwork in here has been done by Mark Silvestri. Really, this omnibus should have probably been called, if anything, uh, X-Men by Claremont and Silvestri and Lee. You know, I know that his name is on the front of the book, to be fair, and the, and the spine, but yeah, this is really more of a Silvestri book than a Jim Lee book, without a doubt. So what's going on during this time then? So really, it's... As I say, it's dealing with the aftermath of, of Inferno. The X-Men kind of lost their identity. Or they kind of lose their identity as a team. They lose their sense of purpose a little bit. Um, prior to Inferno, everybody thought they were dead, including their friends on the other X-Teams. During Inferno, they, you know, they met up with people, revealed that they were alive. They'd been pretending to be dead since Fall of the Mutants as a means to make it easier for them to take on their enemies if they could catch them out, because obviously... If people thought they were dead, their enemies wouldn't be expecting them to attack them as such. Um, but yeah, so during this point in time, it's starting to obviously be revealed that they aren't in fact dead. You do get the introduction of Jubilee into the team here. So she first appears during the first couple of issues collected in here. So she starts hanging around with them as of this point. Um, but yeah, so it starts to be really, things really start to get sort of drastically changed and mixed up around about issue 250, 251 in here, um, where the X-Men end up actually going through the Siege Perilous, which is this kind of mystical artifact that had been given to the X-Men by the goddess Roma at the end of Fall of the Mutants. Basically, it's a kind of... Um, I don't know, like a, a magical device that if you walk through it, it's like a magical gateway and it uh, kind of judges you based on your life's deeds and kind of reassigns you in a way to like a new life. It teleports you, transports you to a different, yeah, identity in a way. Uh, but this issue, issue 248, and by the way, this is a cool feature of this that you do here. You get the cover here, like the original cover, and the reverse side, uh, a recolored uh, alternate reprinted cover, which is pretty cool. Uh, but this is a key issue because it was the first issue, at least I'm very sure it was, could be wrong, don't think I am, uh, first issue drawn by Jim Lee. And there you get that uh, Wolverine image that's actually used on the spine of the book. Very cool. It's not a bad way to draw Wolverine for the first time. Pretty awesome. Um, yeah, so first Jim Lee issue in here. First issue of only a handful, as I say. Don't expect to see huge amounts of Jim Lee artwork in this book, despite the title of the book. Um, and also, I think, you know, these early issues done by Jim Lee are not not his best work. I definitely think he he got better at, at well, he got he became a better artist in general as he went along, which I suppose you'd, you'd expect. But also, his X Men artwork in particular, I think, is looking a lot stronger by the time you get to the stuff in Volume Two than it does in here. Not that it's bad, it's just not Jim Lee at his best. But yeah, so I think in particular in here, you've got Havoc um, really starting to kind of fall into a sense of despair and crisis, really. He's 
he had been kind of falling for Madeline Pryor, um, even though she'd been his brother's wife. Uh, it's a whole thing. The whole Madeline Pryor story really is a mess, to be honest. Um, it's just a bit of a crazy soap opera type thing. But anyway, because he'd sort of been falling for her, she had died at the end of Inferno, so he's kind of depressed about that. Doesn't really feel like there's much point of going on as an X-Man. Doesn't really think that the X-Men in general are even relevant anymore. During this whole time as well, Professor X is not around. He hadn't been around for ages by this time. So yeah, he's, uh, he's at a bit of a loss. Uh, the X-Men end up venturing into the Savage Land here. And a key thing happens, so Psylocke has a vision that the X-Men are about to die. And that ties in strongly to what happens next, where they actually end up going through the Siege Perilous, which happens in this issue, 251. Absolutely awesome cover, I think. One of the all-time great iconic covers there. Wolverine strapped onto the big X. Um, Mark Silvestri cover, very cool. And a very just a very iconic issue in general. I think this is probably the key issue in the book because it contains just some brutal savage scenes involving Wolverine being tortured by these group of by these guys the Reavers who are a bunch of villains who are kind of like cybernetically enhanced altered people so they're all kind of semi-robotic uh, yeah and, and they hate the X-Men basically they despise them they want to kill the X-Men They've captured Wolverine first, and they are setting a trap, waiting for the X-Men to return. This is their base in the Australian outback, and the plan is they're going to ambush the X-Men and murder them. Psylocke knows this is going to happen. She kind of senses them telepathically. The other X-Men don't know. So what ends up happening, a really cool scene here, um, really kind of interesting stuff where she... It's heavily suggested she uses her powers, her telepathic powers, to subtly convince the other members of the team to go through the Siege Perilous and accept new lives because she is doing it knowing that they are outmatched by the Reavers. So she's taking this kind of morally uh, grey decision to have them all go through this magical thing, teleport elsewhere, become other people in a way, and, uh, and leave Wolverine alone for the sake of saving the others. And they actually do it, you know, they, they, have, they go through the magical, mystical portal, the Siege Perilous, and Wolverine is left to the mercy of these people. Um, which leads into really what the next chunk of the X-Men story was after this point. The only person left on this base, not that anybody knows she's there, is Jubilee. She kind of takes pity on Wolverine, she ends up helping him out, and the two of them end up working together. They go on a kind of quest after this to try and find out what happened to the X-Men. So what happened to each of them after they went through the Siege Perilous? And much of this book focuses on each individual member and what became of them. Uh, so yeah, that's a lot, of st a lot going on. Um, it is a bit of a slow read. You know, it's not all action. It's not non-stop excitement. It's not a good starting point to read the X-Men is the bottom line, really. You know, if, if you pick up this book either expecting it to be a good place to start reading the X-Men or a good book to get a lot of Jim Lee artwork, you're going to be disappointed, I think, on both fronts. You need to know what's been going on in the X-Men for quite some time before this, I think. At least since Fall of the Mutants, probably. At least since the Fall of the Mutants events. Ideally, before. Ideally, you'd, read, you'd have read all of Claremont's X-Men up to this point to completely fully appreciate it, but... At the very least, I think you need to know what's gone on as of Fallen Mutants and up to this book to truly understand what's going on in here. If you just start here, yes, there is a summary in the beginning of the book that gives you a little kind of uh, summary of what happened prior to this, but yeah, I think you would be quite lost. I, I certainly would not recommend this as a starting point. I think it's great to read as part of the whole. It's not great to read on its own. You know, this... This really doesn't work as a, as a book to read just by itself. And again, that's not a criticism against the material. You know, it's just that, you know, it would, in long ongoing runs and comics, especially something like Claremont's run that spanned so long and had so many things going on in that run, like literally defining moments that are significant to X-Men to this day. 
not every point of it is going to be a good jumping on point. It's just the way it is. And this is, yeah, yeah, exactly the case. It's not, not a good place to start. Um, but it is very interesting in general. You get, uh, I think perhaps arguably, the most interesting change, the most interesting outcome of going through the Siege Perilous comes with uh, Psylocke who transforms into, probably by this point, the much more familiar uh, kind of Asian body uh, that she has as of going through the Siege Perilous as this kind of ninja. Um, and that's, you know, first seen here in these pages. She's in Japan. And working for the Mandarin, I think, if I remember rightly. Uses the alias Lady Mandarin. Um, Jim Lee drawing this stuff in here. Jim Lee did did draw a great Psylocke, I'll tell you that for a fact. Not just in here, but in general. So that's cool. And then you end up with the uh, X-Men and Jubilee. They track her down, they find her. Uh, Jubilee appearing in that kind of much more iconic costume for her by this point. The same sort of style that uh, she had in the X-Men animated series. Uh, this is really cool. This kind of really reminds me of, um, this is Jim Lee drawing it, but it really reminds me of a Frank Miller kind of page. But this story, this whole story involving Psylocke in Japan, when X-Men, uh, when uh, Wolverine and Jubilee have gone to find, I think this is really good, really strong. It's all about they, you know, trying to break her free of the conditioning uh, instilled in her, kind of snap her out of it, make her realize who she is, which she ultimately does. And then she joins Wolverine, Jubilee, and they continue their quest to track down the rest of the X-Men. Colossus in here, this is where you see what became of him. Basically, he became like an artist um, living in a, in a flat an apartment in Soho and you know the Dazzler became I think she just went back to being like a pop star and she ends up being stalked by this creepy dude um, but you know the common theme throughout is we see all of the X-Men they've been granted new lives alternate lives new identities in many ways I think the idea of the Siege Perilous is it uh, it was supposed to reassign them to being almost bringing out your, your inner heart's desire and giving you a, an identity that fits that. So Colossus being at heart a kind of gentle soul becomes an artist, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but in each and every case, the, the idea is that they ultimately are sort of forced to face up to the truth of who they are, the reality of who they are, um, and go back to being X-Men pretty much. And on what it really all does, I suppose, is it sets up the, um, ultimately, the return of the X-Men. You know, because you could say throughout this time, really, the X-Men are largely disbanded. But by the end of this whole saga that goes on in this book, they end up back together. And shortly after that, you go into the era of, you know, the uh, uh, Jim Lee X-Men series, the adjectiveless X-Men series. So this is really a lot of build-up, a lot of prelude to that. All of it being carefully, deliberately constructed, uh, constructed in quite a meticulous manner by Claremont, as was his way. He didn't rush things, take things nice and slow, something I always appreciated, you know, because things feel so much more natural when they've been built up in such a deliberate way. Here's a bizarre issue. Forge ends up finding a Jean Grey, who's kind of semi-mutated, into this, like, she's got like these alien tentacle things. Um, yeah, bit of a weird one. I think it's because of, um, I think that's because of the mutant mask, who was one of uh, one of the Morlocks who managed to, one of the few Morlocks who survived the mutant massacre. 
Uh, yeah, because uh, Forge and Banshee are a kind of two-man crew going on a mission of their own during this time as all the stories cutting to them fairly frequently, showing what they're up to, and they're also trying to find the X-Men. Storm as well, haven't even mentioned Storm yet. She is a child during this time. Uh, so that's, again, pretty strange. She's been de-aged quite significantly. Don't know how old she's supposed to be exactly. I think she's about 11, something like that. But she does end up meeting Gambit and Gambit is first introduced in these pages. See him here. And he ends up kind of, um, well, teamed up with uh, with this young Storm initially, so, and that comes into play later with Storm, for a while anyway, being the member of the team he most trusts, even after the rest of the team is together, because initially, she is the only one he's actually known personally. But it is a lot of cool artwork in here, it's just not all Jim Lee artwork, which is just something I want to just reiterate again. Obviously when there is Jim, Jim Lee artwork on show, it's very cool. This issue being a perfect example of that. I think this is, yeah, maybe maybe the best issue in the, in the book, to be totally honest. It works as a standalone issue. It's like a one-off story. Um, it's really good. It's this kind of flashback to the past featuring Wolverine, Captain America, and Black Widow. And you get excellent splash page there with Cap. It's a very good issue. It's, uh, I think it's taking place in Madripoor. It's really the point where I think uh, Jim Lee's artwork starts to look really good as well on the series. And issue 269, so this is also where Rogue, who had been absent from the story for a while, so what happened to Rogue, even before the main bulk of the X-Men team went through the Siege Perilous, she was kind of dragged through it against her will, sort of inadvertently. So she had been missing for a while, and I think this is where the story kind of really finally cuts back to her. Uh, <laughs> very nice looking double page spread there, I'm sure uh, a lot of people enjoyed that back in the day. Um, Jim Lee again at this point. So by this point, really just by the end of this book, this is really where Jim Lee starts to become the actual regular penciler. And this is where you get Rogue in the Savage Land, in that famous uh, Savage Land costume, if you can call it that, that she ends up in, this one. It's definitely uh, one of the iconic looks for the character. And she ends up meeting Magneto here as well, which runs into the next key story arc for her, um, which is concluded in Volume 2. Um, in the back, you get this kind of bonus story. I think this is an issue of X-Men Classic, included here purely because it was drawn by Jim Lee. Doesn't have any relevance to any of the content in this book. It's actually uh, an issue of X-Men Classic that relates to the Dark Phoenix saga, I think. Um, then you get this book. so. Slightly oddly, um, after this book, so in between the end of this and the beginning of volume two, is a few issues which make up the Extinction Agenda event. And that is only collected in a, in a separate, long out of print, oversized hardcover, which if you can get your hands on that, well done, because it's, yeah, very hard to find. Or you can get it in just trade paperbacks, or obviously read it digitally. Um, I've just got it as a trade paperback. I'm not gonna go out of my way to find uh, a random oversized hardcover for the kind of money that it ends up going for. But yeah, you have to read Extinction Agenda in between these two books. And it's a little bit strange because 
that does contain a lot of Jimli artwork. So I don't really know why they couldn't have potentially included it either in this book or the beginning of volume two and just put it together. Oh, you know what? Just reprint the oversized hardcover Marvel because I don't know what this rule is that they can't reprint oversized hardcovers. Some self-imposed thing that they do, but I don't know. Um, anyway, then you get to cover gallery, some Jim Lee covers that he did. I think it's uh, not all even X-Men stuff in here. It's just general stuff. All very cool though. And you know, this is a book that, yeah, when this finally arrived, when I finally got it, it was just so satisfying. It was one of those books that was a whale for so long. And it was just great to finally have it in the collection. Uh, that's the uh, image used on the cover of the DM variant, albeit I think that's the original colors. It's recolored for the omnibus cover. Yeah, like that. That's the omnibus version. And that was the standard edition cover as well. So the standard variant is that which arguably a cooler cover. I don't know. I just quite like the matching DM set. So that's sort of why I went for that. But it's obviously all personal choice. But anyway, guys, thanks for sticking around and watching that. I've talked a little bit, <laughs> maybe a little bit too much about that. And yet I also feel like I didn't summarize it enough. Um, but hopefully it gave some insight into what's going on during this era of X-Men and what this omnibus is all about. Um, because I know that some people have read this and been a little disappointed by it. It wasn't what they expected. So I wanted to kind of outline my impression of it and maybe why I think it's not the kind of book that some people think it is. It's not the book to just jump into and read if you're looking for a super high action, exciting X-Men experience. But it is nevertheless a great omnibus and a great part of Claremont's run as a whole. So yeah, take that as you will. And uh, I hope you have enjoyed the video, found it interesting, useful for the reasons I mentioned. Let me know if you've got this book or if it's something you're interested in, not interested in, however it is. You know, I'm always happy to chat about that sort of stuff in the comments. Um, but yeah, anyway guys, thanks again and I'll be back again soon with another video.